So when we're doing our analysis, we need to identify the trend of the graph. Now, obviously, we're expecting more bubbles. So as we go up in temperature, we're going to get more bubbles released. And then it's going to hit a maximum and drop off at the higher temperatures. So that's your sort of overall trend. Obviously, you need to evidence that. So you need to say where the bubbles are going best. So, you know, between temperatures 20 to 50, the number of bubbles per minute increases. Between 50 and 70, the number of bubbles decreases. So that you've got a trend and the numbers from the graph. When you're dealing with the A-level knowledge aspect, so we've got trend, evidence, A-level knowledge, teeing it. The A-level knowledge comes from your knowledge of respiration, so you should be talking about decarboxylase enzymes, the reactions that they are operating in, so you should be talking about the link reaction in the matrix, and you should be talking about Krebs cycle, both generating carbon dioxide. You then need to explain why the number of bubbles increases. So then you're in enzyme theory, talking about enzyme substrate complexes, kinetic energy of substrate and enzyme, and increased numbers of successful collisions, giving you um, an increased number of bubbles. And post the sort of the maximum number of bubbles, you'd be talking about increased vibrations, breaking the hydrogen bonds, changing the shape of the active site and there being less successful collisions. You then need to look at your three repeats and see how consistent those are. So if you've got repeats that go sort of, you know, I got 13 bubbles, I got 15 bubbles, I got 28 bubbles, they're not consistent. But I'm looking to the side because Aisha's talking again. So they would not be consistent because the 28 stands out like a sort of sore thumb. So you're looking for nice consistent results. If they're not consistent, you need to say that they're not consistent. Try and identify which ones are less consistent than the others and identify any anomalies. And then we're into accuracy. And obviously we did in our tub, we put our syringe in, we counted for a minute we counted for another minute, we counted for another minute and didn't move the syringe at all. During that time, the water's cooling down, so your reactions could be slowing just because the water's cooling down. So you should certainly talk about that. The improvement to that would then to use a thermostatically controlled water bath. Obviously, because we left the syringe in, it's only got a limited um, volume of substrate and concentration of substrate, so that would also, your substrate will be being used up during those three repeats and you should address that by making fresh solutions. Obviously yeast is a living organism, it's a micro microbe, so it's a fungus, it buds, and the numbers of yeast cells will go up in your solution during the experiment. So again, making fresh solutions for each one would certainly improve the accuracy of your experiment. Um, one of the things that you might have to do in an exam is, is use this method to investigate something else. So common things might be to look at the difference between glucose and sucrose as a monosaccharide versus a disaccharide. You might think about doing a t-test to test the difference between the means, doing lots of repeats, calculating a standard deviation. You could investigate the effect of pH. Um, to find out the optimum pH for the yeast, or possibly um, concentrations of inhibitors or using different inhibitors for respiration. I didn't think of anything I missed. Should have probably used tongs. Don't mind. What are you doing now? <laughs> and shout out for the incredibly noisy group. <laughs> yeah, I sure you may well hide your face.